Hi guys, have you ever heard of Dendera Temple? Known as the sixth gnome of Upper Egypt, it is one of the best preserved ancient temple complexes on earth, and it bears the scars of what must have been the most frightening and destructive of events. An event that is ignored by the majority of modern academia. The complex spans some 40,000 square feet, and within the temple is some of the most well-preserved ancient artworks of anywhere in Egypt. Along with preserving the exquisite art and decorations, the temple also preserved evidence of something we were not taught about in history class. Upon the granite steps, which still lead to the temple's roof, in direct alignment with a small window cut into the thick stone wall, is evidence of severe melting. At one time in the temple's long life, the steps within were turned into liquid magma. What catastrophic event could lead to the melting of granite steps through a small window in the wall? Were such events commonplace, or was it the result of an accident? Is this why the ancient structures were built with such huge blocks of stone? Many have speculated that the Dendora Temple is built upon an even older site. Are the steps surviving remnants of this much earlier complex? Were they part of a structure that once witnessed a solar flare, perhaps, or maybe a localized supernova? Many who have examined the steps and the surrounding area have speculated that nuclear blasts may have been detonated within ancient Egypt, or even before. The ancient site in India, for example, 10 miles west of Jodhpur, with radiation that was so intense the area is still highly dangerous. An ancient layer of radioactive ash was discovered that covers a three square mile area. Scientists investigating the site where a housing development was being built established that there was a very high rate of illnesses in the area. The levels of radiation were so high the Indian government eventually cordoned off the entire area. They later unearthed an ancient city, which shows strong evidence of an atomic blast dating back some 12,000 years, which destroyed most of the buildings and killed an estimated half a million people. Did nuclear war occur in our distant past? Were these ancient structures which have stood the test of time actually built as bunkers? With melted steps and irradiated ancient cities found throughout the world, the evidence is certainly Firstly, many thanks to Ellen Lloyd over at AncientPages.com for her extensive research and writing on the conspiracy. Has a buried city within the Grand Canyon been covered up? The Hopi Indians have a traditional story told to them by their ancestors. It details the original pyramid builders living in an underworld in the Grand Canyon. Dissension arose between the good and the bad, the people of one heart and the people of two. Machetto, who was their chief, taught them how to leave the underworld. He caused a tree to grow up and pierce through the roof of the underworld, letting the people of one heart climb out. They settled by Pasisvai, Red River, which is in Colorado, subsequently growing grain and corn. They then sent out a message to the Temple of the Sun, asking the blessing of peace, goodwill and rain for people of one heart. But their messenger never returned. Among the engravings of animals in the local caves is an image of a heart over the spot where it is said the entrance to be located. This legend was learned by W.E. Rollins during a year spent with the Hopi Indians. An article published in the Arizona Gazette reinforced this legend. Ever since the article appeared, there has been a lot of speculations whether an underground city actually exists. David Hatcher Childress, who examined the story, said, Perhaps the most amazing suppression of all is the excavation of an Egyptian tomb by the Smithsonian itself in Arizona. A lengthy front-page story of the Phoenix Gazette on April 5, 1909 gave a highly detailed report on the discovery and excavation led by a Professor S. A. Jordan of the Smithsonian. The World Explorers Club decided to check on this story by calling the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Speaking to a Smithsonian staff archaeologist, they told her that they were investigating a story from a 1909 Phoenix newspaper article about the Smithsonian Institution's excavation of rock-cut vaults in the Grand Canyon where Egyptian artifacts had been discovered, and whether the Smithsonian Institute could give me any more information on the subject. Her reply was as follows, The first thing I can tell you, before we go any further, is that no Egyptian artifacts of any kind have ever been found in North or South America. Therefore, I can tell you that the Smithsonian Institute has never been involved in such excavations. While it cannot be discounted that the entire story is an elaborate newspaper hoax, the fact that it was on the front page, named the prestigious Smithsonian Institution, and gave a highly detailed story that went on for several pages, lends a great deal to its credibility. 
it is hard to believe such a story could have come out of thin air. Is the idea that ancient Egyptians came to the Arizona area in the ancient past so objectionable and preposterous that it must be covered up? Perhaps the Smithsonian Institution is more interested in maintaining the status quo than rocking the boat with astonishing new discoveries that overturn previously accepted academic teachings. Historian and linguist Carl Hart, editor of World Explorer, then obtained a hiker's map of the Grand Canyon from a bookstore in Chicago. Poring over the map, they were amazed to see that much of the area on the north side of the canyon has Egyptian names. The area around 94 Mile Creek and Trinity Creek had areas, rock formations apparently, with names like Tower of Set, Tower of Ra, Horus Temple, Osiris Temple, and Isis Temple. Could these legends actually be true? As always, thanks for watching, guys. Take care. In 1988, while in Egypt, hunting for ancient relics, Swiss archaeologist Gregor Spree would stumble across a once in a lifetime find. After paying a handsome fee of $300 to be allowed to inspect the grave robber's collection, he would be handed a package, wrapped in rags, and apparently with quite a musky odor. Within, he would discover an enormous mummified finger. It measured an amazing 16 inches in length, resulting in height estimates of 16 plus feet, for the original owner of such a monstrous digit. Spree recounted the moment he laid eyes on the finger to a local press newspaper, when he released the photos to the public. Quote, I was allowed to take it in hand and also to take pictures. A bill was put next to it to get an idea of its enormous size. The bent finger was split open and covered with dried mold. It was surprisingly light, maybe a few hundred grams, my heart was in my throat. Some believe the finger may have belonged to an extinct prehistoric giant ape, but alas, like so many other artifacts of this nature, subsequently vanished, shortly after it gained public attention. Also the ape in question died out hundreds of thousands of years ago, and a digit of this ancient animal has never been found, we have only ever found small bone fragments and teeth. Imagine then the odds of finding a fully mummified finger from the animal within a tomb raider's collections in Egypt. They are probably quite slim. Also leaving the question as to how it ended up mummified in Egypt a tough one to answer. He returned to Egypt in 2009 compelled to learn more about it, but unfortunately, by then, the old man who allowed Spurry to take the pictures had vanished, and with him all traces of the mysterious finger. If there was found to indeed have been a race of giant, highly intelligent humans that colonized ancient Egypt, it would help tremendously in explaining the construction of the pyramids. India possesses an enormous array of incredible ancient architectural accomplishments. Mind-boggling feats of ancient engineering, many of which continue to mystify modern explorers and elude modern understandings. Exquisite details displaying prodigious artistic abilities and accuracy. Ancient stone carvings, which seem all but impossible, yet here they are for all to see. We have in the past explored many of these sites. We have explored the similarities in tool marks found at other sites all over the world. The now lost methods which were utilized to once carve entire temples from a single block of bedrock. We have also investigated the many temples constructed from quarried stones, temples which possess columns seemingly created on laves, yet many of these pieces weigh in excess of six tons. Just how these feats were accomplished remains a complete mystery. And our next architectural anonymy is of no exception. According to mainstream academics, Virabhadra Temple was built by the brothers Varana and Varupana which were governors under the Vijayaranga Empire during the reign of King Achutaraya within the 16th century. Located in the village of Lepakshi, a significant place in the great Indian epic Ramayana, legend has it that the bird Jatayu, wounded by the king of Lanka, fell here after a feudal battle against the king. When Rama reached the spot, he saw the bird and said compassionately to him, Lepashki, meaning Arise Bird in Telugu. Although the temple is claimed as the work of said brothers, just like that of many other incredible, inexplicable sites throughout the world, any explanation as to how they achieved this incredible feat remains elusive. Additionally, there is one feature in particular which not only remains unexplained, but its past purpose 
or perhaps more importantly, how this feature was successfully created remains unknown. Known as the Hanging Pillar of Lepechki, it is a column which initially appears to be a weight-bearing structure. However, on closer inspection, one discovers that this column is in fact set aloft, with its significant weight somehow being dispersed along the temple's roof. It is as if the builder of said temple created the column as a statement, a display of their incredible abilities and architectural skills. The column seemingly serves no function other than to display the capabilities of the temple's builder. It is as if they were simply showing off. Furthermore, along with a past purpose remaining elusive, just how the temple's inner structure actually supports the weight of the column is also an unknown. How can one be expected to believe that a temple such as this, located among many of India's other astonishing ruins, one which possesses clear displays of complex, advanced, and in-depth understandings of load-bearing architecture, along with the majority of its existence currently unexplained, was supposedly built by one of our well-studied ancestors a mere 500 years ago. How can one accept this as a logical explanation for its origins? The Hanging Pillar of Lepashki is clearly an incredible work of ancient engineering, one that, although claimed as the work of known ancestors, remains largely unexplained. It is a temple which we find highly compelling. Every now and again, you stumble across an artifact, an ancient relic so astonishing, with such an enigmatic history and indeed properties. Only the most reliable of sources will suffice in satisfying doubts regarding authenticity, which will inevitably surround such objects. Impossible artifacts are extremely hard for some to digest, especially those with careers built around a paradigm, which said objects suggest were constructed upon a lie. Sir David Brewster must have experienced this personally, yet regardless, he still courageously brought the object before the dragons, or more specifically, the American Journal of Science. Quote, I have to bring before the section an object so incredible, only the strongest evidence could render the statement at all probable. It is an authentic ancient rock crystal lens. End quote. Roughly translated, Sir David had put his neck on the line for the truth, a truth which speaks of ancient advanced technologies. Discovered amongst the ruins of the treasure house at Ninenova, it had lay, undoubtedly, for many centuries, possibly even millennia, within the ruins of this once magnificent city. Although many have attempted to discredit the lens as a mere ornament, Sir David Brewster has courageously fought on regardless, arguing against such claims by stating that the convex nature of the lens, along with mysterious ancient gases and liquids which were once encased within the lens, made it a once-efficient optical magnifier. It still has the remnants of 12 cavities upon it, which once contained some form of liquid or gas. Ten had been opened through damage over the eons, yet remarkably, two were seemingly still intact. The surface of the remaining cavities, Sir David claimed, were speckled with amazingly iridescent spots, far more vivid than a peacock spots, known now as the Nimrod lens. Italian scientist Giovanni Pettinato of Rome proposed in Babylonian astronomy that the lens was used by the ancient Assyrians as part of their telescope, explaining their detailed knowledge of astronomy, in particular Saturn. The ancient Assyrians were able to see Saturn, believing it to be a god surrounded by a ring of serpents. The British Museum's curator proposed that the lens could have been used as a piece of inlay, perhaps for furniture, or for magnification purposes, such as starting fires. Yet no mention of the mysterious gaseous fluids which were said to have once filled the original relic. Unfortunately, we may never know what happened to the authentic liquid-filled original artifact, and although it is claimed that the Nimrod lens is on public display at the British Museum, it is rarely spotted. We find the claims made by Sir David Brewster to have been highly compelling, though unfortunately, they may never be taken further.